can't read my own hand.
right, guys, let's get started. Okay, if you got your Bibles, Matthew 13, where we are. Matthew 13. My iPad was dead, so we're using a laptop today, so we'll see how this works. Won't be as easy, but we'll go with it. Okay, let's pray together. King Jesus, we know you to be God the Son, the Lord, the ruler of all nations, that all things are under your feet, created by you and for you. We want to hear from you. We want to know who you are and know the things you've commanded us to do that You've called us to be a disciple who makes disciples, so show us now what are the things that we must learn and what are the things we must teach others to do. I pray you'd find us faithful in doing that very thing. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. All right, a couple announcements for you. Just make sure that every week you're getting a um, little bulletin printout. So this week, uh, it's a good chance you're going to see a few things in there that are new. Uh, stuff that comes from student ministries. So students are going to be raising money to go to camp and mission trip and a conference. So all of that's in there. And then you're also going to see a thing called 80-20. I think it may come out this week. If it didn't come out this week, it'll come out the next. Um, so you'll be the first to hear about it. Uh, other than the finance team already knows about it. 80-20 is going to be a one-day uh, giving event that we're going to do just to see what kind of dent we can knock on the uh, this building. Um, and 80% of that would go directly towards that debt. 20% would go to directly to something you would see happen here. So that so many of you weren't here 20 years ago when the building was built and purchased, so you kind of feel like I wasn't here on that, so it's hard to really kind of give towards that even though you're experiencing the fruit of that now. But the 20%, you're obviously going to see right away. So there are different, several things. Uh, I don't want to point those out because if you haven't noticed them, I don't want you to notice them anyway, but uh, if you've used the front bathrooms in the lobby, yeah, that's pretty bad. So uh, those are going to be uh, probably a priority number one because any guest who uses the restroom goes to one of those two. And uh, if you're a guy, which uh, guys don't notice it as easily, but next time you go in there, just kind of stand there and look around a minute and you'll see uh, we've needed to clean up and update a little bit in there. Uh, yeah, just a little. Um, so, uh, but so go ahead and start praying about that. Uh, basically, uh, we're just doing a one-day thing. Uh, we want you just to, to pray about what can we do on one day, and then we're going to basically through the next several months talk about okay, what's the next thing we're going to try to do? Is it going to be a whole uh, time of giving, you know, committing for a year, or we're going to do a big plan, whatever? But we're just starting uh, with this one thing. It's the last Sunday of March, um, so right before basically spring kind of opens up and right before Easter, uh, we're going to tackle that. So I'm going to preach a little bit about it in March and we'll talk more about it, but that's just a quick update. And then those of you that know Miss Paula Elmore, uh, she's been put on hospice now. Uh, she's in the hospital over at North Georgia. If you want to visit her, you're obviously welcome to do so. Um, in Gainesville. Uh, I've been over there the last two days. Um, so they're pretty good spirits. They're, they're possibly going to move to the hospice floor uh, today. I don't know if that actually happened or not. But um, So Paula was her normal chipper shed self the last two days. It's been fun to go over and hang out with them. Uh, so but they are over there. You can go visit them. Uh, even if Frank has told you not to go visit them, that was prior to. Uh, so Obviously, if you know them well, then if you have time, go over there and say hello to them. So right now, she's on the fourth floor. Um, they'll make you wear a mask when you get in the hospital. Uh, but other than that, you know, they'll ask you if you have COVID. I don't know why anybody would say, yes, I have COVID. <laughs> but anyway, they're going to ask you that. But other than that, um, at the front door. So 
She's in the South Tower, so don't park at the North Tower and try to have to walk the South Tower unless you want exercise. The last four visits I've made to the hospital with four different people, I've parked at the wrong tower. <laughs> and uh, But I don't mind walking, so it's no big deal. But it's you just funny. To. I can't, I know. I just can't ever seem to get my act together and uh, figure out, like, I probably should check out which tower they're in and then park at that tower. But anyway, so, but I never do. But. Okay, so we've made it to Matthew 13. We finished up Matthew 12 last week. And uh, Matthew 13 is... Uh, a well-known text. Uh, these are some well-known parables or three parables that happen in this text. Two of those are explained by Jesus uh, because the disciples were very much like us. Sometimes when we read things that Jesus says, it feels like we're reading code. And uh, if you're anything like me, I don't want a lot of detail to the story you're going to tell me. I just want the bullet points and I want you to get to the point. Um, oftentimes because I'm the Lord's trying to teach me patience, and I'm not interested. So, um, but this is one of those parables that, if you've got any experience, you know, reading the New Testament, reading the Gospels, you kind of know what this, this this is about. So we're going to look at it. Uh, the disciples needed uh, a little bit more explanation than they felt like they were receiving. We're going to skip a section of text in here, so you're going to notice that we're going to go from. Um, verse 9 to 18 because 10 through 17 is when they ask him why are you talking in parables and he explains that so we'll do that next week okay but then right after that he explains this parable so that's why we're gonna you know play cut and paste here tonight okay all right so this is longer than we normally do normally we're three or four verses but there's not there was no reason to break this up because it just unless we do a two weeks part but we're, i don't think we're going to so I'm going to read it. If you got your own text, you can read it. If not, watch the screen. All right. On that day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into the boat and sat down, while the whole crowd stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, Consider the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it didn't have much soil, and it grew up quickly, since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it. Still other seed fell on good ground, produced fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty times what was sown. Let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. Now, verse 18. Listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one who's sown along the path. And the one who's sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. But he has no root and is short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he falls away. Now the one who's sown among the thorns, this is one who hears the word, but the worries of this age, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But the one who is sown on the good ground, this is the one who hears and understands the word, who produce, <clears throat> who does produce fruit and yields some hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what is sown. All right. So take a second. What would you highlight from this text? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another page, and I'm just going to, well, we'll see. These are my nicknames for all the soils. No, I was not giving Beth nicknames. 
See the text, or is everybody ready? Okay. Now you probably need to call out your verse because if you want me to highlight, because it, it's a little bit different with me having to use the uh, pad up here on the. I, can't, I don't have my pencil. I can't. I mean, I do have one, but the screen doesn't let me do that. Okay. What would you highlight? Verse 9. Twenty-one. 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 The whole verse, anything in it? The whole, all the time. Okay. Six. The second half of the verse. Nineteen. Nineteen. And then twenty-two, the second half of the verse. Verse one, city. I know what the shortcut for highlight is. Or if it's shift eight, let me try that. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I'll just keep going up there and doing it that way. Verse three told them many things. Where? Three told three. them many things. teacher in high school that she was literally we were all 18 so she was 24 and she was just a smart aleck you know but funny like and so it's cutting up well I came in one day and it wasn't the day to do that I was right next door to the basketball coach so she's like Dustin needs to go out in the hall so I just started laughing I'm like I'm not going out in the hall and she's like no today's the day I'm not acting like me she knocked on my basketball coaches. 18. So, she went and got the basketball coach? Oh, yeah. 18 years old, and I got a paddling in the hospital. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just listen. So, listen. Just two words. And I ran, ran, ran in practice that day. Okay. Back and forth. Foul for birds, whichever is there. Birds. Devour, devour. Just kind of like yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Let's walk through it. <clears throat> so the first half, remember, is just Jesus telling the parable. Then, then we'll skip the part of text, and we'll talk about um, in the coming weeks about why are you talking in parables, and then he explains why he talks in parables, and then obviously we're going to connect the end. Okay. So we'll do our best here. All right. All right. Start at the beginning. Uh, on the day that Jesus went out of the house, uh, out of the house is not in all the original manuscripts, so therefore it's not as important. One of the main reasons it's connected in most of your translations is because he was in a house when his mother and father, were, mother and brothers were standing outside. So most likely, uh, if this is all directly connected from uh, one moment to the next, then that's why it would be in there. Uh, but it doesn't have a lot of uh, meaning, and because it's not in some all of the original manuscripts of this. Some commentators just say yeah, it's there, but it, it's not, doesn't have any. But either way, the difference in here is in the house teaching versus outside teaching. Uh, very rare, very uncommon. Uh, and then moving on, I think Jackie, you put out there um, 
when our house is sitting by the sea. Um, the, the sitting portion here is not that big of a deal. It's going to be the fact that when he sits down here. But if he was sitting, if he needed time to be quiet, don't we? Yeah, but it, it, that's just not there. And that's also not common necessarily for him the way this is connected because oftentimes when he got away, he got away where you couldn't get to him. Yeah. Uh, um, good. Contrary to what you mentioned earlier, McGee mean, made quite a thing out of, out of the house, he said, represents he was leaving Israel and the whole crowd represents the Gentiles. Opinion. Okay, I, I just think con contextually that's difficult just for, from from the previous ending of verse 12, but I mean I understand why, why he's saying that. But Okay, so sitting by the sea as in there's not a lot of other than Jackie that is a good example or just the fact that he's out there, but the, the, the hitter in this first two verses is when he sits down you remember uh, previously when Jesus is teaching uh, in Matthew 5, he goes, when he sees the crowds, he goes up on the mountain, and when he, remember verse, and when he sat down, he began to teach them, saying, that is the sign of the rabbi. This is how he sits to teach. He doesn't do what I'm doing right here. He sits to teach. So it's, the, and then they would have sat around him to, to take instruction. So this is where it was important. And why this matters. So this whole crowd stands on the shore uh, to hear. He's obviously not trying. I would say, I would kind of make an argument he's probably not trying to get away because he knows that they're going to be around um, in the process because uh, the whole crowd, large crowds are coming. So is he changing the venue so that he does have access to more people? Because <clears throat> if he's in the house, like you said, people were crowding in. So when he went outside, Well, most likely, yes, he was going in the setting to where he was going to teach again. again. Yes. And then this is not the first time he gets in a boat and teaches from the sea either. Um, and this is a, a very common thing for him to kind of use that as his uh, podium, per se, or his stage. Um, say again? Yes. Okay, verse 3. Everybody, everybody go verse, first, two chat, first two verses. Okay. I'm going to move on from there then. All right, then he told him many things. He's got lots to say. These next three parables in this text um, are going to matter to life. They're going to explain, um, in this case, um, salvation and what you do after salvation uh, or after you have an experience. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, and then your next two parables are going to do some, uh, some other things. And so that's why it's... Many things, they're going to learn lots of theology. You're going to learn lots of things about God. You're going to learn lots of things about salvation. You're going to learn lots of things about um, the church. You're going to learn lots of things about my email, apparently, popping up. I don't know where. <clears throat> A lot of people waiting on replies, I'm sure. Okay. All right. Verse 3. He told them many things in parables. Why do you think he teaches in parables without looking down at your verses and seeing? Really? Okay. Easier for them to understand when they do correct. Okay. You know, how they take it. What, you know, certain people take stuff a little bit. In okay. In Corinthians, it says if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them who are lost. Right. Who Satan is blind to the eyes. Okay. So if you go on and read later on, don't go, you can read that later on your own time or when you decide not to pay attention to me anymore tonight, you'll notice that he's telling them, uh, I'm doing this in parables because Israel's had enough and I've had enough of Israel. And so now it's not going to be for them to hear anymore. So then that's where McGee would go with, and I get that's why I'd say I get that, why he's going there. Um, that, that now Israel and those Jews who are standing around listening, no more. It's done. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much the main argument. Now, obviously, some people from Israel are still going to come to faith in Christ, so it's not like he's blinding them completely because some of them are. Uh, we've already met a couple of those anyway. You're going to meet more of them as we go through the Gospels. But as the nation as a whole, that everybody's going to get it, you've already seen that many of them are even saying he's from Satan. 
So the, this is going to be a text, and the other two are going to be stories that they're just, the more they hear, the less they understand. The more they see, the more blind they become. Um, and that's, that's the process of even, I don't want to get too far ahead there here, but it's the process of becoming inoculated with the gospel. You've heard it so much, it becomes a story, and it's not much different than little bunny foo-foo. And it has no eternal good in your life because it really didn't transform anything. It just became a story that you know the, you know, the intro, the body, and the conclusion, and you've kind of got it. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Okay. So verse 3 told them many things in parables, so we've kind of talked about the reason why. Yes, because it is something that they can understand, because we're going to talk about farming, so it does make sense. But at this point, Israel is just going to become colder towards the gospel, or towards Jesus. Uh, so consider the sower. So everybody would have known what that was like. Uh, one commentary that I was reading behind, it was a little annoying to me to read behind him, but um, he was talking about, uh, that everybody would have understood this and most of all those farmers who would have heard this would have been poor farmers so they would have thought some of this scattering seed and it getting lost would have been crazy because that never would have happened and I'm thinking you seriously spent four pages telling me all of that when it's a parable it, I got, it doesn't make any why are you defending how ridiculous this farmer is because he didn't exist anyway sorry that's my rant for tonight okay <clears throat> so Consider, picture in your mind, put this together, think about this. I'm about to give you a story that didn't ever happen, but it's going to have a spiritual meaning. It's going to be, I'm going to make it up, but there's a reason behind it, okay? Consider the sower who went out to sow. So they would have all understood what that was like, what it looked like. Bag over the shoulder, going to a field that he owns. He's, got, he's going to have a method. He's going to, go, uh, he's going to have a process. This is what he does. Verse 4. And he sowed. So he's doing the work. He goes out to do the very work. Some seed fell along the path. Don't get too caught up in the whole idea of falling. Um, as you probably all know, as you've, if you've ever been around farming before, uh, every now and then you'll see corns growing in the ditch. How did that happen? Okay. Doesn't take a master scientist to figure out why the corn is over there, okay? All right, you've got everything from <clears throat> malfunction of a tool, weather, sorry, help. I mean, you've got all kind of things that can take place in the process. Yes, okay? All right, consider the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed some seeds, some fell along the path. And we also understand uh, path can be a couple different things. Is it the path to the field? Is it the path that he's already got? in between rows in the field we don't know okay we just know that the path is around the field somewhere and the seed is falling all right you can make the assumption either way i think you're pretty safe in figuring it out um you know obviously if you've ever been around farming um as i have if you were to dare walk in certain rows and not walk in the paths you might ought to stay on that end of the field or uh because <laughs> when you come back it's going to be a beating all right <clears throat> So some seed fell along the path, so we don't know if this is intentional or if this is while he's sowing. So we just kind of give you, I'm just going to throw a bunch of stuff out that I've read behind, okay? And so uh, things that, that, this is, it's not the point. So what I'm going to give you is what's not the point so that we don't spend too much time there. What's not the point is that it's actually on the path. Was he sowing right up to the edge of the path? Good chance, okay? Was he sowing and trying to take advantage of every single spot he had that, that, that made sense for him to grow? Yes, but it's a parable. So why is it on the path? We don't know other than it's accidental, but he's sowing, okay? And so is he getting a right up next to the path? Most likely, all right? Now, this path idea is you've got a couple things going on. You've got, what's your path look like when you're looking at a field? Okay, what else? Okay, what else? It's clear. Okay. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard and matted down. Okay, so it's not going to be, so you can walk out into a field that's been tilled and go out there and take the dirt and it feels like it's softer than your pillow. Okay, if you walk back over on the path, it's hard as a rock, right? Okay, all right. <clears throat> Some seed fell along the path and because it's on the path and it's not actually planted okay 
the birds came and devoured it. So the birds came, take it, they eat it, they move on. It's not too difficult to understand that birds eat seeds, right? Okay. All right, other seed fell on the rocky ground where it didn't have much soil and it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. Those of you who know anything about farming, where is the rocky ground usually found? Um, near the path. Near the path. Or? Where it hasn't been plowed. Okay, where it hadn't been plowed. Or if you picked it up out of the field and moved it to a certain location, right? And so sometimes you probably put it on the path to make the path harder or you put it right down the path to make it all pretty as you walk out to your field or whatever, you've moved it over to the side. Obviously, it's going to be connected to the path because that seems to be the line that Jesus is walking through and he's explaining the story. So we're going down the path. We're getting near the rocky ground. Maybe it's the, maybe we're, we're not into the main field yet. So this is how, basically, remember, he said, picture this. Put this in your mind. Think about this. They all would have been able to do that. They all would have had that experience already in their own life. Okay? All right, so rocky ground where it didn't have much soil. So what does that tell you? Shallow. Okay. There was some. But there was some, okay? So there is the ability for it to take a little, right? There is the ability for, for germination to start, something to start taking place that it's designed to do, okay? All right, to have much soil, it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. All right, we'll come back to that in just a second, but why would it grow quickly? Because <clears throat> the seed's shallow. Okay, so it's gonna, it, the sun's gonna draw it up faster. Okay, it's not gonna actually shoot down. It's trying to get out and it's making its way. Okay, grow up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. Moves on, verse six. When the sun came up, it was, excuse me, it was scorched. What does it mean to be scorched? I didn't bring tea. Fried, burnt. Okay. Sweet. Will it produce? Yeah, no, I'm fine. Don't go, no, don't give me no tea. I just, I normally bring one up here, and I was turning around looking for it. I try to make sure I don't step on it. I'm fine. Okay, what produced? Did you answer that question? No, it's not going to produce anything. All right. Since it had no root, it withered away. So it's basically useless, right? Okay. Uh, what do we do with this right now? What do we do with this now? Not really supposed to, but what do you do with this now? called Roundup, okay? Verse 7. <laughs> Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, okay? So this most likely is better grounds, right? Uh, so it's real funny to read behind commentators as they begin to argue, why are there thorns there? Is it a new crop of thorns? It's baby thorns that are in the ground that the farmer doesn't know about? Is it the thorns that he pulled out and it didn't get the root? Is it thorns that are on the edge of the field as they make their way in? Y'all, it's thorns, okay? All right, in the field, okay? So I'm just telling you, I struggle sometimes reading this because I'm like, man, y'all really are chasing one here. Okay, but it's making sense, okay? Thorns in the field, obviously we know wheat and tares, we know weeds grow. Uh, you have to go out there and you're told oftentimes never to pull some of those weeds because you'll pull the plant up, all right? So you have to let it live, you have to let it exist, and you're just, of course, there are obviously different ways to kill it now, but. All right, verse eight. Kill the soil, good. Yes, that's good, that's good. All right, verse eight. So other seed fell on the good ground, produced fruit, some 100, some 60, and some 30. So what did this seed do? Okay, and what did it do that the others didn't do? Okay, no, before that. Y'all get y'all going all the way to the end. Y'all like touchdown game over. Like what did it do? It grew. It grew. It it flourished. It flourished and Thank you. It, had, it took root, right? It didn't just shoot up, did it? Okay, did it process inside? It began to spread, it began to drink, it began to germinate, it began to do all the things it's supposed to do, and then it made its way out. Which process is slower? Right. Okay. Which one do you see the fruit of? Right. Okay. All right. Now, he finishes this parable with anyone who has ears to hear, let him listen. Let him hear. This is as let anyone who has ears listen. But everybody knows that, that this King James is much better than this. Anyone who has ears to hear, let him hear. Um, so. 
Why do you think he makes this statement? Oh, come on. <laughs> be, a, be, a, be a northerner. Go ahead. Take your turn. Go first. She's a northerner. I was. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Free, <laughs> free salvation. <laughs> this is online. I'm going to be in so much trouble. <laughs> well, I was going to say, let anyone who hears listen, it's referring to like the, the fact that they're farming. He's sowing most likely corn. If he's grown ears of corn, just listen. Okay. I don't really know where Okay, going. all right. That know. does make sense, but that's not exactly where he's going. That is a neat way to think about that. Um, <laughs> that's not exactly what, what he's talking about. Uh, but he is talking about listening. Yes, sir. I mean, I would suggest that Jesus is indicating at the time that the Holy Spirit is not empowering everyone at the time who understands the parable. There are obviously some here that don't understand it. He's speaking in parables for that reason, but we skip that section, and I think this links back to it that, you know, God calls. Okay. He's working with certain people at certain times, and I think that's that's why everyone doesn't have the ears to hear what he's saying. Okay. Isn't that basically what you do every week? Every Sunday? I mean, seriously. Uh, again, back to McGee, he says the sower represents Jesus. And the soil represents the world. And as you give forth the message, you know, everybody hears, but they don't react the same way. It's really a salvation story, is it not? Yes. In essence, this is going to be rooted in what a person does with the gospel. Okay? All right. But anyone who has the ears to hear, let him listen, is referring to spiritual ears. It's not just can you actually hear the story. There, where you're going to that. Uh, but you also got to remember the section I left out here. Um, why are you talking in parables? Well, because they're going to keep on seeing, they're not going to see it. They're going to keep on hearing, they're not going to hear it. Because Israel, like this was it. Like this is, for the most part, the nation was rejecting Jesus because of the consistent rejection of Christ. Um, they were going to get <laughs> stuff in parables and not have a clue what's being told. Now, in this case, be very careful because the disciples don't get it either. Okay, But this message is for them. All right? So this story and the explanation that we're skipping here is not a conversation that's directed at the crowds. It's a conversation directed at the disciples. Yes? At the end of a lot of parables, he says that. Yes. Um, just example, <clears throat> how it ends in Matthew Should be, right. Yeah, good point. It's almost like he's saying if the Holy Spirit's talking to you, pay attention. Or if you feel something weird happening inside of you, pay attention. Okay, all right. That's, you know what I mean? Like, people I understand will what say, you're saying. If it's Holy Spirit, your heart is something <clears throat> faster and you'll feel really or Something like that, almost like drawing attention, like, hey, if this is speaking to you, listen close. Okay. So let me, Seems before like we go any further here, have you ever heard... Prior to your salvation, so everybody's salvation story is different in this room, most likely. Did you ever hear the gospel preached? So that's the good news about Jesus Christ. And you didn't respond to it. Like you just went and just yeah. went about your day. <laughs> okay. You see, that's where we are. Okay. <clears throat> so how many people do you know have probably sat next to you in a pew and they heard something preached. Okay, anything, by any preacher, it doesn't have to be me. Any preacher. And you were like, man, you know, man, the Lord just spoke to me, the Holy Spirit's convicted me that I gotta do this. And they looked at you like you had two heads. Because they didn't hear any of that. They didn't see any of that. Now I'm not mocking any of those people. It's just that, that this is what we're this is where we're going. 
at that point, they may not have ears to hear. Okay? They don't have spiritual ears to hear what's... It's just information. It's just a guy yelling for 45 minutes. It's just a lady teaching for however long. And it's just, it's just words on a screen. It's not really... So the ears has to do with conviction. It has to do with a spiritual response because these are stories with spiritual meanings. All right? So, verse 18 starts. So, listen. So this implies that the disciples had what? Ears to hear. Ears to hear. <laughs> now, not all of them had ears to hear. So you got to remember, the group of disciples here, it's not limited. We don't know that this is just the twelve. Because there are other people who are referred to as disciples. Remember, there are three categories of disciple in the Gospels. One is, well, it's just four. One is the three, James, John, and Peter. It's the inner core. Then there's the twelve, which includes Judas. Then there's the crowd. Okay, did I do four there? Or did I just do three? three. One, two, three. Okay, all right. So then there's the crowd, which ends up being about four to six hundred disciples that are still around in Matthew. This is why I do this. And then there's the crowds, the big crowds. But then when he says something crazy, they walk off. Okay, So we still know that by the end, in the end of Matthew, there's still 400 or so that are still around. So we kind of got to give them a little bit of credit. Uh, so we don't know if this is the 400, if this is the 12. It's most likely not just the three. Okay, But inside the 12, if it's just, let's just limit it to the 12. Because we, we're not giving that information here. Somebody doesn't hear it. Got it? So he sits under every lesson, every sermon, most almost every sermon. He hears parable, he hears story, he watches miracles, he sees life change, he experiences um, what could not be explained with the physical. Like he goes through all of that. He does not have ears to hear. He is Israel and does not have ears to hear. Okay? And don't mistake his conviction at the end for repentance, because it's not. Okay. So when he gives the money back, that is not repentance. That is doing what's right, but it's still not repentance, because repentance would have handed the money and went and found Peter or James or John. That would have been repentance. It would have been... Let me go to the cross. Let me go to the grave. Let me let me go back to the lap. You know, let me make my way back. Uh, that was repentance. This was not. So ultimately, when Judas kills himself, that's just extreme guilt. And a lot of people can die with extreme guilt and shame, but it not be repentance unto the Lord. Okay? All right, verse 18. So listen to the parable of the sower. So pay attention and listen. Judas obviously still chasing butterflies. But the beautiful part of this is that most of the disciples are still not getting it. Okay? All right, so they're having to put the pieces together just like you and I did the first time we ever heard this parable. All right? When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one that was sown along the path. So let's spend some time here. Who is this person? They don't have a name. This, who is this person? Would say, Charles, Charles. I say you, I thought you were talking about the evil one. You talking about the person? Yeah, who's the, the person one? first? Yeah, we'll get one. to the evil one in a second. Yeah. Judas. Okay. I mean, Judas obviously is seems to be the one that is prime, but Judas actually mm -hmm. is going to show up in the first three. I said the unsaved. Okay. But who is this person? Like, the, give me some description. Like, that doesn't actually follow Jesus. Okay. Potentially. Did you say the Christian that doesn't? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I mean very loosely using the word Christian. Okay. Because there well there is a phrase that was that was very popular in the seventies, eighties called carnal Christianity. Okay. And well, there was a little song that went along with it when I was in kids ministry. It said I don't want to be I don't want to be a carnal Christian. But when you go back and read the scripture, carnality and Christianity are two different lifestyles. What I think it was meaning was a Christian that keeps going back and putting his funeral clothes on. But eventually, you've got to have a conversation and say, have you really ever understood the gospel? If you keep going back to that, then have you really well, understood? People who don't know what they are, if you say, are you Christian? Like, I had this experience a lot 
and work, I would see people who would call themselves Christian, but there was no fruit, and they didn't even know what salvation was necessarily. But they didn't have any other faith, and they they learned about Jesus off and on growing up. So that's okay. You know, that's what I'm okay. referring to. Like they know there's Jesus, and they know there's God, and they believe Jesus is real, but that's about the extent. Okay. So this right. could be the guy who agrees with everything Jesus is saying, but doesn't take the next step. Okay. De just denies, just, oh yeah, that's a great word. And then goes on and does his own business, whatever it is he does. Doesn't take time to consider what the word's saying. Okay. Anybody famous you know might go in this category? Joel oh. Osteen. <laughs> that was wrong. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? I'm not allowed to make fun of him. I get in trouble at home. Well, there's a lot of them. I mean, you think of a look at Oprah. I mean, she supposedly was raised in a Christian family, and then she got too big for that. So okay. she sort of manipulated it to be what she needed it to be or wanted it to be. And Until she made that statement on one of her shows that you're just a good person. Yeah. Okay, you're yeah. Yeah. She is. She is. She has said on, on the air, that there are many ways. Yeah. Uh, there was a guy who came out. Who was exposed and hurt. Right. And okay. Over and over. Well, she got a lot of okay. pushback. All right. Thomas Jefferson was a <coughs> deist. He uh, created his own New Testament by cutting out all the parables and I mean all the uh, miracles. Out of the entire New Testament, cut and paste it, and made his new, made him a new Bible. Uh, so I would include him here. Uh, so obviously he's he, he's okay with the words. He's okay with the goodness of Jesus. He's okay with the morality of Jesus. But he's not okay when we start getting into things that he can't explain, or when he starts talking about the fact that he died and rose from the dead. Jefferson's not okay with that. Um, Gandhi. Said he liked Jesus, everything about Jesus. Jesus' teachings were solid. Uh, but when he starts talking about miracles and being the king of glory, he's out. Okay, So um, we don't necessarily like to call names out, but these are people who've made public claims so that we can say that. But then we've also, you know, maybe you're kin to somebody like this. I mean, my dad was around the scriptures his entire life. He was raised by a pastor, and then his son becomes a pastor. And he's heard my granddad, my great granddad, preach probably hundreds of times. Heard me preach several times, but it didn't ever seem to take root, and it was always very frustrating to me. How does it not go further than just knowledge? How is it that you just hear it and kind of shake your head in agreement, but it doesn't do any like it, there's no life change whatsoever? Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, that that's that's uh, also another group we can put in here probably are the Christers. You know what a Christer is? Easter, only Christmas. Christmas and Easter. <laughs> okay. Krishna. Oh my God. Christmas and Easter. Okay. Uh, like Mormons, it, Jehovah's Witnesses, those that sort of kind of. I just Bible. put them in the cult. I just. Uh, <laughs> I know. That's what I'm saying. But I mean, they all. Like, yes. You started with that as a basis. You get your own plan. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 85% of the people that's in the cult came out of a Bible. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yeah, when, I, when I lived in Arizona for a summer, I was a missionary there. One of the places, I think I told you all this, places I was in was the second highest population of, of those who were Mormons uh, outside of Utah. So in Arizona, it's the second largest group. And uh, the joke is that many of them, they're either unchurched or became Mormons and the white caps on the mountains are their uh, Baptist letters they threw out when they were coming over the mountaintops. Uh, so uh, this is where I also run into, this is where I would categorize people who walk up to me and tell me that they're Presbyterian, Methodist, Independent, whatever. Like that's the initial statement when they hear I'm a pastor. Like I'm not interested in what denomination you're in. I want to know, are you a believer? Like are you walking with Jesus? Because we'll, we can argue and wrestle over denominationalism later. Okay. Um, and you might win the argument. Most likely you won't, but it just, <laughs> but you know that's not what we're after, you know, because that's I mean he's not talking SPC, you know, Methodism. I mean he's not talking that here. He's talking about 
You've heard the word of God. You've heard the message of the kingdom. What did it do? And it did nothing. Okay? Um, but most likely here, you'll see something in this text. Uh, the kingdom, <coughs> the, the evil one comes and snatches away. Go back, go back up. There. The kingdom doesn't understand it. Okay? He doesn't, I mean, he just, he just hears it. And it's just words, okay? Even if it's words that he kind of agrees with. Uh, most people <clears throat> don't get into the politics of the world. They don't really care. So they thought that it was stupid for you to go to Lowe's and Home Depot and for them to tell you happy holidays. They thought it was equally as stupid as that for us to make sure that we said it back to them. They don't care either way, okay? That's that. This is where I would put that category of people. All right. Also, in uh, Barna's research, that the highest number of people that's growing in our in our country are the people who uh, check the nun box when it's asked religion. Nothing. No, I'm not, I'm not, I don't believe anything. That's where we would put this category. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's keep going. How far did we make it? Verse twenty. So that was Rody. This is Rocky. And the one sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. But he has no root and is short-lived. When distress or persecution come because of the word, immediately he falls away. <clears throat> All right, tell me about this guy. What's he look like? What's she, what's she look like? The 13-year-old the week after church camp. Oh! <laughs> Stevie going right after camp. Okay. so true. <laughs> Alright, what else? The, what, like the, the child that, like for me, like when I was younger, it was forced upon me, but it doesn't necessarily take root unless you're all in. Okay. You're, you're pushed into something, not necessarily going to fall through. Okay. Potentially the peer pressure. Everybody else walking down the aisle, walking down too. Okay. Yeah. Someone accepting it and then not having a group of people to lift him up and grow him. Okay. Somebody not decide. Okay. Somebody accepting it today, but well, let's sort of forget about it tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> or seeing the benefit of it and being excited about why they do it and, you know, that it's eternal life and that's easy and sure I can do that. And then when they really start to grasp what they believe is the truth without getting the whole truth, then they're like, wait a minute, or just not having ears to hear. And they're like, oh, you know, that's too legalistic for me. Or, oh, that's not, that doesn't go well. It's the person more that goes with the, with the yeah, world. It's more of an emotional <coughs> pain rather than yeah. a spiritual problem. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to ask you a question. It's not going to hurt my feelings. Matter of fact, I, I hope my, the answer is not me by any means. Who's your favorite preacher? I didn't say pastor, preacher. I'm supposed to be your favorite pastor. Your favorite preacher. Adrian. Okay. Who else? My favorite teacher is Joyce Meyer. Okay. Who else? David Platt. Okay. Who else? Thomas Meyer, you are. Jim Burkett. Who's the Eric? Oh, my favorite is Paul the Apostle. Okay. What's your favorite sermon they ever preached? God's Hall of Fame. Hear the silence? Okay. So, go ahead. I mean, I like the one on the spirit filled life. Okay. It was basically a very detailed dissertation on how we plan our lives daily in Romans 6, 7, and 8. Okay. I've heard that sermon 20 years ago. Okay. But if we stay here long, your well's going to be proven to be very shallow, right? You're going to remember bits and pieces of sermons that were said, but you're not going to go through this long list. Oh, man. When, sometimes you will, but most of the time you won't, okay? Now, so you know that about you. That is not a shot at our ability of anything. That has nothing to do with our spiritual good, okay? 
because those pastors don't probably remember half the sermons that you remember anyway. So you think about what you have to sit there and you'll go, oh, I remember when Adrian said that, you know, like, I don't remember anything about Adrian's best sermon, but I remember Adrian's testimony when he told me, when he told how he came to faith in Christ, and then when he told how he was called to ministry, and I was sitting on the second row. I was already in awe of the fact that I was sitting that close to Adrian because he's the prince of preachers, and then when he tells the story, I'm like, holy cow, because the Holy Spirit's like, this is how I, this is how I worked. So I remember that. I don't remember anything about when he said, turn in your Bibles. I mean, okay? So... Yeah. <clears throat> what, where I'm going with that is, is that most of the time we remember our favorite preacher and some of the favorite things that they said or, you know, something about that. You, you look at the fact that you forget even some of the best stuff that was most productive for you. This group forgets it all. Okay. So it doesn't stick at all. This is a very like, quick through. So think about this. Uh, what's one of the dumbest inventions? What's well, in my opinion? Okay, you may not agree. What's one of the dumbest inventions that's ever been made to help you stay awake? <coughs> you don't drink Sell it at every gas station. Five-hour energy. Five-hour energy, okay? <laughs> or some version of it, right? Probably all the rest of them are knockoffs, okay? And so that's, you know, whatever they're hot, mostly probably caffeine or whatever. Some people believe in it. I got a couple of buddies that drink five of them a day. And I'm like, bro, just go to sleep at night. Like, <laughs> like, How is their heart not like save, that? Well, I don't understand. That? Save some money, you know. Uh, but this this whole idea that this is going to be the answer, and so you're running to that, and but you're still having to keep going back to it, and and it's not really giving the fulfillment you need. Like exercise, sleep, well balanced diet, those things have been proven to help you. Not, you know, I understand a random, I mean, Waffle House is what got me through college. So I would say that that is, you know, two o'clock in the morning, you know, uh, smothered and covered. I mean, that's what's <laughs> going to get you your education. But, you know, but those are just little tiny, that, that's not what's well balanced. That's not what's going to help your body be the way it's supposed to be or to grow or what have you in the way it's designed to do. This case, this person hears something, but the root is short lived. So. If your favorite was Billy Graham, okay, how many people walk the aisle of Billy Graham? And Billy will tell you the worst part of two worst things he'll tell you, because I'm gonna always include this. Number one is he missed out on his family, but number two, what's the follow-up? That I mean that there was nothing wrong with preaching the gospel, because he could preach it and he would tell the gospel. You didn't have to agree with his background, you had to agree with his denomination, you didn't have to do all that. You didn't, and, and a lot of people enjoy going after him because he didn't seem to really go deep. He just went, this is the gospel, you ought to respond. This is the gospel, you ought to respond. And there was a lot of response, but there was a lot of this. And he'll tell you that. Because there was no follow-up. Because this right here has got to be explained. Right? So in America, you don't really see that maybe like you do in a communist country. Okay? You won't necessarily see a version of persecution, but you'll see it in the locker room. You'll see it in the business world. You'll see it in the business world. Yep. Um, and then obviously now, I think more and more in our culture, it's a little bit more aggressive. Uh, the uh, Civil Rights Act thing, if it gets passed, that we'll see, hopefully it won't, but that will bring its own version of persecution that the church will have to fight in the court because uh, it has nothing to do with civil rights. It has everything to do with all the letters of the alphabet, the plus sign, okay? All right, so distress comes along, persecution comes along, uh, and immediately they do what? They fall away, okay? When this gets hard, when this gets difficult, well, let's just add this. Let me just add some fun things here. When the sun comes out and the temperature is 70, so let's not get too deep on it. Like, let's not even go, because per persecution can just be, why are all my buddies playing golf and I'm at church? You know, why, why aren't we at the beach? Um, and so there's nothing wrong with the beach or golf, by the way. I enjoy both of those. Uh, but when they become the idol 
or they're the determining factor of life. And, you know, you can fill in the blanks of, of all these different things. So it doesn't necessarily have to be jail and beatings and all of that. Persecution can just be what well, the rest of the world's doing it. I mean, I got a son that loves baseball. And travel baseball happens all over, and I don't think there's a team that he couldn't make. But I had to tell him in the very beginning, listen, we just can't do it. This, this is what matters, and this is who we are. And so we have a rule. You get to do one tournament in a year, and that's typically if you made the all-star team, and if they decide to play and it, it happens but the way that happens, you get one. That's it. No more. And so that's hard for me because I, he goes out there and he has this great game, and you're like, dang, this boy could really be just tearing it up. And then I think about it. Like, that, is that what I want to grow him into? That's temporal. Is that what I want him to worship at? You know, so I don't want that shallowness in him. I want depth. Um, you know, and then what happens when he's 18 and he's like, I don't want to play baseball ever again. Well, then I've just wasted his childhood and I've missed the opportunity to make sure he grows. So, if he doesn't get to play minor or major league. Yeah, well, yeah, and then if, and then if he gets cut off and he's got a dream, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's not a shot at anybody that does those things. I'm just telling you that that is. That's just world reality, and you've got to think through that, okay? And that, for me, that's where we were, because, I mean, I I didn't even know what travel baseball was until he got a little older, and then I was like, yeah, I didn't know. so. All right, verse 22, let's keep going. So that persecution can be like, you know, uh, parents looking at me saying, why don't you let your kid play? Well, you know, I, had, I had, <laughs> I'm kin to one who said, well, they do a devotion every Sunday morning. <laughs> So my next question was, who does the devotion? And then when I heard that answer, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely making the right decision. <laughs> okay, but that's still not the point. I didn't understand how that doesn't get, come across. But it doesn't come across. So I quit getting aggravated about that. So I, I was in staff meeting when I first, my first year here in staff meeting. I said, listen, here, I don't know what your past experience is, and, but here's how we operate as a staff. We don't talk about church members. Okay. You don't talk about church members. You got a question about church members, you can talk to me individually. If there's a sin problem, we'll address it. But if they got an opinion about something that's different and they don't like something I said, don't come tell me. Because it does, unless it's going to affect our ministry, don't worry about it. And then if you get upset because they decide, for instance, they're going to go to another church, or they they like the the music somewhere else. Okay, we're called here. God's called us here. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Don't, don't worry about that, all right? And then, well, what about people, man? I just tell you, we got lots of people that are playing travel baseball. Keep preaching the word, stay faithful. If you want to walk across the room and talk to them about it, you're more than welcome. And you say it in love and you have, you know, be a brother or sister in Christ. But, again, they have a responsibility to hear the word and respond to it. It's not our job to be Holy Spirit, okay? All right? So, just kind of a house rule that we have so um, it, and it's funny how it comes back to me because every time we do like a big program here when there's a lot of people here and they go to other churches they'll walk up to me and they'll say we love this church but we go to this other church because of and I'll just start laughing I'm like I wish the staff could hear this right now <laughs> alright verse 22 now the one sown among the thorns this is the one who hears the word but the worries of this age and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful okay so Thorny gets, seems to get a little bit further, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Okay, so he takes on some growth, right? Look at the text. Mm -hmm. He hears the words uh, in the actual other, I guess the, the Luke version of this, uh, it says that he grows up with a thorn. I think that's right. Somebody can check that on me. I'm not really sure. I have to double check the cross reference here. Um, but this has got a little bit more depth. This is where he stuck around, so he's not a creaster. Maybe he comes every Sunday morning. Uh, maybe he even goes to Sunday school, maybe not. Um, maybe he's uh, a little bit more uh, into it, per se. Uh, but what's his problem? The world. Yeah, he can't give up his other idols. Yeah, like the, the society. How would he handle if I preached a sermon on giving? <laughs> 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 You know, I mean, it's a spiritual whatever. Don't get caught so much on wealth, but 
but get caught on wealth because this is another thing that Jesus returns to. Listen, you can't you can't worship it because we understand. Look, let's just be honest. Money makes life happen. Now, obviously, we understand spiritually God makes life happen, but God uses your gives you money to to buy your meals, to buy your clothes, to pay for your house, all of that. Okay. Doesn't have to be an idolatrous kind of situation. Money does that. Money also makes ministry happen. Missionaries go overseas. We buy supplies. Pastors get paid. Buildings get provided. So money is involved in all of those things, but it's never intended to be the thing. Okay. So it it, it has to be never given a, a, an equal seat with the Lord. All right. But that becomes the problem. Right. Because there is a deceitfulness that you must have wealth. You must have more. You must have, you must build barns for your barns and more barns for those barns. Okay? And then Jesus says, well, you're an idiot because tonight you're going to die. And what are you going to do with all that? Yes, sir? I mean, I think this, at least for me, this is the greatest threat because, you know, the worries of this age. I'm distracted. I'm busy. And I'm easily distracted from things I need to be focused on. And I also think the deceitfulness of wealth, part of that is it's false progress. <coughs> you know, we, we think when we're making financial progress, we're making progress as individuals. And, and, and we, but we're really not, okay, because we're all going down and take the thing with us. So I just think, you know, it's, that, that's the greatest threat to most Christians is we're overly busy, we're distracted, and we're looking to other things to measure as a measuring rod for our progress in life. And I, and I think it distracts us from what we really should be focused on. You know, the Mark and Mary thing. Okay. Right? We need to be sitting at the feet of Jesus, not being worried about all these other things. I think that's where this person is. What's a worry of this age? Two more cracks. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> Retirement. Okay. <laughs> Politics <laughs> and retirement. All right, what else? It could be little things like teaching your kid how to sleep through the night, which is my reality, or doing school. Did we get it, not enough school work done as a homeschool family? Just little things that are constantly in your mind that are trumping God's word. Okay, so let me give you a perfect example of that. Um, which this is, it, let's say that you are trying to grow, okay, in this category. Um, and, and so you get up in the morning and you start to read the Word and then you think about the 12 things you got to do. And then you start worrying yourself to death about that, okay? This is at a whole other level because this is going to be the unbeliever. So I want you to see. So make sure that you make the difference here. Okay, that's still going to happen for you as a believer. All right, you're still going to do that. That just calls for your discipline. All right, so that's a whole other story. So don't go too far with what I just. I probably shouldn't use that as an example, but but that's where it would start for this person, where it would be very minor. Okay, now this is going to be. Well, I can't go to church because I got to go get eight more hours in, and I can't. We can't go to church because. If we don't take him to travel ball, then he won't become a college player and he won't get in the minors and he won't get in the majors. Um, we've got to get more money, so we've got to work. So we can't tithe and we can't give to the Lord in 